Yes. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Thomas, for the invitation to the session. Um, and my presentation entitled Hidden Stairways at the Foot of the Himalaya will, um, will present results from geophysical surveys and excavations carried out last year in the Popchika Valley in Bhutan. Um, the main aim of this Swiss Bhutanese project or Bhutanese Swiss project is capacity building in this small kingdom and the institutionalization of archaeology in Bhutan. It's done by education of, of several people and involvement in the archaeological research and also in practical training. So the project was initiated by Karma Vizier from Bhutan and it's in cooperation with the ETH Zürich and a team guided by Philip de la Casa and financed by the Swiss Liechtenstein Foundation for Archaeological Research Abroad. Um, small introduction into the location. Uh, the Kingdom of Bhutan is located in between um, China and in the north and India in the south. It's a similar size like Switzerland, about 8,000 80,000 square kilometers, but less, much less dense populated with less than 1 million people. And so it was my first time then in Bhutan last year. And when I came by plane to the capital Timpu, I, I saw this mountain ridge. So from the plane, and it's here in the, in the northern part of, of Bhutan, and it's called Ganga Pinsum and it's about more than 7,500 meters high. And interestingly, it's the highest unclimbed mountains in the world. And the reason for that is because mountaineering is not allowed in Bhutan. There are several hiking tracks, but there's no, no alpinism, as we know from, from other areas. And the reason for that, of course, is because the mountains are sacred and, and holy places. So the uh, research was done in, in the Popchika Valley. It's located here in between central and western Bhutan in a, about 3,000 meters high. Here's a picture from the Popchika Valley itself. It's named after a famous monastery located within this valley. And you see here in the, this area, it's a red marshland. And yeah, to refer to your presentation with a, with a mountain. So if you are standing here, you are looking a lot of mountains, but not that high elevated or not that impressive as from, from Tibet, I guess. Um, okay, first step was an archaeological prospection done by the Bhutanese Swiss team over several years. It ends up in this map of historical sites. It's a Popchika Valley, it's about 15 kilometers long, running north-south. Here in the north, there's a, there's a pass. Um, this point here, it's a famous monastery I mentioned. It's located on a, on a hilltop. You have several tributaries running from the east into this valley. And here this, um, pointed are several archaeological finds. In total, there were 93 finds spot mapped. And among them, there were 49 so-called burial mounds or artificial mounds, which could refer to, to burials, you know, among other um, elements like yeah, terraces, um, artificial hills, and, and so on. Um, most prominent, for example, is this one, M1, um, near to the famous Gangtri Monastery, and M49, uh, near to the junction of this small stream into the main valley. Okay, so um, um, regarding the burial mounds, there's not that much mo known yet about the mounds in, in Bhutan. So referring to farther north, to Tibet, so I found this um, sketches about the shape and the dimension about burial mounds in Tibet, it was a uh, scientific work from an Aust team of Austria. You see they are, could be round, they could be rectangular in shape. No, but what is clear for the mountain, or for the burial mounds in Bhutan, that they are endangered. For example, the Mount M49, it, it looks like this now. So it's a 
cut it mount as seen in the aerial pictures from 2011. And five years before, it was still existing at one of the bigger mounds in this valley. So there's a clear demand for, for research as well and for protecting the cultural heritage. Okay, the research approach last year was first um, go there and start a geophysical prospection to get information about, or more information about this mound um, on a non-destructive way. Um, six mounds were chosen for this geophysical survey. Here's a map. There's a mound M, M1 near to the monastery. Um, one, another mound M3, or here M1 is this picture. Uh, it's a, a yeah, isolated single one, but near to stone structures nearby and, and near to the monastery. Then another mound um, on, the, on the western edge of the valley. Um, and a group of mounds located here in the southeastern area. For example, the big mound M49 I already mentioned. Um, another mound M31, which is much smaller, but also with a capped uh, surface. You see here next to this mound a small um, pit discovered um, on site. And so there also this mound could be located in a row. This, for example, it's a group of three mounds or with prayer flags, one next to each other. We selected the central one for geophysical surveys. And the sixth one is also one of a, of a bigger group located in a fenced area near to a nunnery cluster. So I will come back to results, or select these three mounds to show you the main results of the geophysics. Okay, how to survey a mound geophysically? So, uh, you know, there are a lot of, of methods available. If you look for near surface features, mainly magnetometry is used. If you go into greater depths, uh, examples from, from Greek with using seismics or gravity, if you have cavities like in Newgrange, um, we choose two complementary methods, GPR and resistivity tomography. GPR, maybe you know from the recent excavations done in Norway. So there's a nice ship within a burial. That's, uh, yeah, the pictures are derived from GPR surveys. So very brief introduction into this methodology. So we used to, of course, we have to think, okay, we go to Bhutan for one week. What can we carry? We used a single antenna with a survey wheel, so a, a system with a certain frequency, more um, focused on depths instead of high resolution. You always um, think about this beforehand. And yeah, the survey itself runs on parallel profiles. Here's one section um, of a profile. You get um, reflections um, here, for example, on the bedrock if you um, put it onto the topography you have to also to, to measure and have a several assumption about the velocity of the electromagnetic waves. You get, for example, this cross section with a, with a bad rock and here, here is, you see it cle clearly seen that this artificial mound is erected on a more or less solid bad rock and within you get reflections, diffractions from different um, features, mainly stone features. Okay, so complementary method, we applied ERT is much more effort because you have to put electrodes into the ground to, to get a, a current um, flow in, in the subsurface and so you measure the potential difference and then you can derive the resistivity distribution. It's always three-dimensional, that's what Z pictures should point out. Um, here that's a model you can derive if you make a several measurements on parallel profiles. And yeah, the main difference to GPR is that you can get a greater depth of penetration here visible. That's a, uh, three up to four meters achieved on, on Mount uh, 31, for example. Okay, that's where the two methods we applied in different ways. We had only six days for six months. I will show you results from three of these mounts. Um, first, it's a single located mount M1. Um, the lower left picture showed the results of the topography measurements we did here. You see these, these lines. Um, here's at the highest point, it's 
the valley. And as you can see, that it's more or less uh, some rectangular shape can be expected. Uh, with the GPS, we additionally measured the, the stones visible at the surface. Here it's more or less a scattered distribution in this picture, but in details, for example, the stones here are clearly visible as uh, corner stones of a foundation. Now, here's a GPR in this case, we carried out in two directions. Um, so the orange dots are the interpretation for a certain time depth, so that's this below um, the surface and, and one meter you see it's, they are more or less scattered, so a less clear image in this case. Um, we carried out some resistivity survey here. I have one section um, running diagonal around mount, this mount. Um, so that's the resistivity distribution. So the high resistivity here, probably because of a um, topography effects, but I want to refer to, to, st uh, to a sequence of low and medium resistivity visible in the sections. Um, so mount 31, the center one in a row of three. We have um, clear indications of rectangular features. That's for a, for a depth of, of, of one meter. And if, you, if we sum up for several depths, we see that it continues um, in several depths, this rectangular or linear features um, up to 1.6 meters. So also here we have a rectangular structure. And then came to Mount 31. Um, here also we have clear linear structures below the surface in a depth about one meter, um, showing an X-shaped feature of about five by six meters. The pit nearby was um, not excavated, but cleaned during the, the first campaign in spring 2018 and derived in also uh, some charcoal to, to, to get in date, which is uh, pre-Buddhist um, times. Okay, and then half a year later, the, the team from Christian Bader and colleagues um, started an excavation, so Mount M31 was chosen for this, so it was already endangered. And so they excavated this. Um, the re results will be uh, published soon. Here's some first impressions. So they reveal the X-shape feature. Interestingly, it was, it was open. So a set of rectangular stones. And if we compare it to the geophysical surveys, we can say, okay, we clearly derive the main features, but also in, on, on, the, on the edge of this mound, there were some hidden steps. We did not see clearly in the GPR results. The reason for that is that we did only a survey in one direction on this mound. And this could be to think for, for future service, you should be invest more time and work in two directions to gain all the information for the subsurface structures. Okay, so to sum up, um, we did a geophysical survey on, on six of, in total, more than uh, 49 mounds, which give a good idea about um, the subsurface structures. We used two complementary geophysical survey methods. And four of this uh, mounds here, 1, 31, 33, and 36, they clearly point to rectangular structures. And the ex excavation at Mount 31 confirms these results. And to, to sum up, um, they are showing yeah, rectangular structures, probably platforms erected on a natural ground. And we conclude from the geophysical results and the excavation that there are very likely no burials below this structure. And also on the big cap mount 49, we see really clear that it's erected on a bedrock. Main features are destroyed and there's no bigger structure below. Yeah, that's a final result. The intention was to, to show the different perspective if you use natural scientists to um, yeah, get answers for your archaeological questions, I hope. Thank you.